Uh, did you watch the debates? Did you watch all of the debates? Yeah, how many did not finish them? Yeah, I, me neither. I, I made it through half of them, and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. Uh, so I just picked up the, the synopsis the next, the next day. Uh, of all the presidential debates I've ever seen, that, was, uh, that one was kind of off the grid, wasn't it? Uh, what happened during that debate? Well, um, anger replaced argument. Uh, emotion replaced substance. Evasion uh, replaced answers. Uh, personal disrespect uh, replaced respect. Uh, indecency replaced decency, and on and on goes the list, correct? Sad to watch. Uh, but, uh, but as I uh, turned it off about 9.30 and I told, told Liz, I said, this is going to so upset me. I'm not going to be able to sleep. I'll just have to read what happened the next day. Um, it really is a microcosm of the country, is it not? Because what you have is, is, is a truth and error conflicting with each other, light and darkness battling it out. And it's just now, it's been going on since I was a kid in the 60s. It's just now bubbled up to the surface to where we can really see it. Uh, and it really makes you stop and think as a Christian in the world in which you live, what is my responsibility in a world that is in conflict like that, that tension between light and darkness? Because it's going to get more pervasive as we head toward the time of the end and the coming of the Christ. How am I supposed to live? What am I supposed to do? David understood this because in his day, there was all kinds of political tension, spiritual tension. Uh, he lived in what we would call testy times. Uh, and he'd had his fair share of uh, political intrigue and people that were opposed against him and arguments and debates and nasty people trying to get rid of him. Uh, and he, he sits down as an older, an older king, an older military man, an older politician, and he writes down, some assume to his son Solomon, but to other political leaders, if you're a godly man, this is how you should function when you look at the world in which you live and as tumultuous as it is. So the main motif that we're going to cover, and there's 40 verses here. So this is going to take us, uh, I don't know, seven or eight months to get through this. Um, no, I think we're going to do it in two Sundays. I think we can do it. Uh, throughout this entire chapter, uh, David's going to cover one motif, and it's going to be the question on how are saints supposed to live in tumultuous, testy times, in like the times in which we live. And so, I, you know, the, the times were testy when I was a kid in the 60s. They were that way in the 70s. They are that way in the 80s and beyond. Uh, there's always some new uh, opposition from those who uh, disrespect the gospel of Christ, morality, etc. What am I supposed to do? Now, what David does in this psalm, uh, if you could read it in Hebrew, and this is one reason why you'd want to go to school and learn Hebrew, is you could see what David actually does in this psalm. Because he, this psalm is an, an acrostic. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a type of uh, psalm where every so many verses has a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And I'll talk about the validity of that after I show you the Hebrew alphabet. So I think I have a slide on the Hebrew alphabet. There. Easy, right? No? Okay. So if you start over, you, you read Hebrew from right to left, okay? So Aleph is the first letter. So Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zayin, Chet, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Meim, Num, all the way down to Tav, the last letter on, on the bottom, the T on the end. He, every single verse has those letters. And they, uh, they're, they're kind of like two verses is, is off on the Aleph, and then like two verses is on the Beit, etc. He does, his, his, does the whole thing like that. So when you read it in Hebrew, you're like, he wrote this around the alphabet. Well, what's the logical question? Why would you do that? I don't know uh, if you ever put together uh, memorization devices when you were in college to memorize things for tests. I did uh, because, you know, the brain's only so good. So you, you get your little thing together and you memorize your little story. Uh, and, and, and then that represents, you know, triggers a word and you remember you know, the content that you're supposed to put down for a given answer. This is what he does. He puts the entire, the entire chapter around an acrostic for one reason, and that is to help you memorize it. Why would you want to memorize it? Because David says, this, this chapter is so important. I want you to make it so a child can memorize it. So when I was in college working on my uh, first degree in the Old Testament, um, uh, I memorized this psalm for a, for a class because the teacher said if you um, want extra credit on your next test, if you memorize uh, a, a something in the Psalter, I'll, I'll give you extra credit for every so many 10 verses. So I picked this. It's like I get a lot of extra credit points, and so, so I memorized it uh, because of the value of it. And ever since then, I'm glad I memorized it because it's changed my view of how I, as a young man, and now uh, I'm still a young man, uh, <laughs> should, should live uh, in, in, uh, in, in the, the God, godless world in which I live in. I was getting my hair cut on Monday. 
And I told the young lady who was cutting my hair, I was like, could you just cut off the gray and leave the other stuff, you know? She did that. She laughed at me. Yeah, anyway, uh, there wasn't anything left uh, of my other hair color. So uh, what does David do here? Uh, acrostic, for, for what purpose? To help you memorize it. So what's your job assignment for the next week? Right, to memorize it. Fret not because of evildoers, neither be thou envious of against the workers of iniquity. And start memorizing it. Put it in your heart. So next time you're yelling at the TV, you can stop. Because we're going to talk about that in a minute. We're going to stop. And then you go, oh, no, Marty said... Okay, and you quote Psalm 37, 1. Uh, there's a tension in this passage, as I said, between light and darkness, good and evil. And until Jesus comes back, there's always going to be tension in our world. I'm not going to solve it. Uh, we can be salt and light when we're supposed to be, but there's always going to be tension. There's, so there's uh, sin, sin tension. There's also tension in this, uh, this passage from an eschatological perspective, prophetic perspective. Uh, when Jesus ascended and the disciples stood uh, on the mountain and watched Jesus ascend on the Mount of Olives, and the angels are standing there, and the angels told the disciples, why are you man looking up? Because just as he goes, he shall return. So he, we know he's going to return. So when Jesus returns, that's eschatology. That's the prophecy. Uh, that's the long view. What's the short view? Well, the short view is in light of his return, I should live differently in the here and now. And that's the tension in the passage. It's a tension between what is my life now and what will be in the future? Uh, I can't just so focus on the future that I'm no earthly good now. I must focus on what is yet to come, the kingdom of the Messiah. That should change how I live in the present, correct? We're done. <laughs> yeah, no, slightly not. We want to look at uh, this whole th the concept of how should a Christian live in t testy times based on the long and short view of life tension. Uh, the first concept is long and short view of life should be don't get uptight about that which is temporary notice what david says he says number one i wrote this song it's a song they use this in worship it used to have uh, a, a melody put to it we don't know what that is anymore but it's it's something that he wrote for temple worship it says it's a psalm of david what what's the first thing that he does well he gives us a, a negative command he says do not fret because of evildoers nor uh, be envious of workers of iniquity uh, do not fret uh, is better translated do not be provoked. Uh, the word uh, chara in Hebrew uh, means to get literally hot. Why are you laughing? I haven't said anything yet. Uh, it's hard to hear your laughter in here because the room is so big. So if you laugh, could you please de be definitive for me so I'll know you got it. So he says, don't get hot under the collar. Were you mad any time this week? Say it's not so. Did you get mad in traffic? At the television? I mean mad? Uh, it, when you get mad, you get hot, right? You can just feel the blood rush into your head and, and like your nose gets red. In fact, there's a Hebrew word for anger that means you've got a red nose because you're so mad. And he says, uh, uh, don't, don't, don't fret. Don't get hot under the collar because of who? Because of who? Evil doers. Evil doers. Uh, who, who is that? Well, those are people, it's really easy. Those are who do evil. Are evil doers. Well, the word for evildoers, ra'ah in Hebrew, uh, is used in a variety of ways in the Old Testament. Psalm, or Isaiah 59, 15, uh, uses it uh, of those who act in a way that is completely displeasing to God. God says, live this way. The evildoer says, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Uh, I saw a sign the other day, uh, an old picture of Billy Joel back in the day, because I liked Billy Joel. He played the piano. I love to play the piano. Shows him standing in front of a, a sign which says no public drinking, and he's standing there drinking in front of the public sign. See, that, that's an evildoer, flaunting the law. Uh, I, Hosea 6, 8, it, is a, it, it has a synonym used there. Uh, synonym is the word oven in Hebrew. And, uh, it is wedded to the concept of murder. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4, that particular word, evildoer, uh, describes uh, people who don't tell the truth or liars. That would apply to some of our culture. People who absolutely just, they cannot tell the truth. He's, he says, don't get all upset concerning those kinds of people that get you to, to the point where you lose control. Again, let's go back to your television. You're watching the news. It's going off the grid. You're watching a debate. You're getting hot under the collar, Correct and you're talking to your iPad in bed. I cannot believe they just did that, I can't. You ever done this? Why are you so quiet now all of a sudden? Yeah, what did David just say? Relax. If it's your wife going off the rails, look at her and go, honey, relax. Remember the sermon? Don't, don't, don't get all uptight. Does that mean that a Christian can't be upset about that which is immoral? No, no. 
I mean, we absolutely can't be up, upset and, and concerned about that which is immoral and that which is inappropriate, but not to the point of being just openly, combatively angry and exploding all over the place. See, the last thing that a non-Christian needs is a, is a Christian that's just hostile. But it doesn't mean you can't be concerned. He says, don't, don't fret about them. Why? Well, because if you think about them in relationship to the future, well, Christ is coming back. He's going to settle things. And peace will reign. We'll get there in just a minute. Uh, so I want to ask a, a logical question for you to sit and think about. Don't answer this question. It is not a rhetorical command, a question demanding a verbal response, okay? Why do evildoers upset you? What sets you off? Why do they say, well, I'll give you some reasons. Uh, they always seem to get their way. It just seems that way more often than not. The uh, the godly, or at least the moral among us, uh, they always seem to get caught on some kind of technicality and fraction, and then hammered because of it. Uh, they, they outnumber you, hence they appear to have great power. They get more airtime in the media because there's more of them. They always play the victim when they're the victimizer, and on and on it goes. Why do they upset you? And, and David says, I know, I've been upset by evildoers, but I've, I've learned to not just get so uptight about them because I have a long view of life. A logical follow-up command is this. Don't, don't, be, don't be upset about these evildoers, nor be, be envious of the workers of iniquity. In, iniquity, uh, it is a word, it has three log- lexical connotations in Hebrew. Number one, it denotes uh, violent deeds of injustice. Go pick any in our culture. There's all kinds of violent deeds done uh, in, that are completely unjust. Uh, number two, it can, it can denote injustice of speech. Uh, So pick any kind of hate speech laws that they pass at a university to control a Christian conservative voice. That is an unjust, iniquitous type thing, according to this word. Uh, Number three, it can denote injustice in general, which covers everything. When when God says this is just activity and the world does the opposite of that, it's it's unjust, no matter what it is. He says, don't be envious then. Why in the world would you be envious of a person uh, who's doing things that are all about iniquity? Well, because we're, we have sin about us. We have a fleshly nature. So we're tempted to envy those who get away with things because that's kind of cool. Uh, we're tempted to be envious of those who push parameters and they get famous because of it. We're tempted to be uh, envious of those who are financially prof- prosperous, even those are, although their lives are built on iniquity. We're tempted to envy those wicked people whom the masses tend to look up to. I mean, it just comes with our carnal package. But what did David say? Don't envy them. Don't ever envy them. Why? Well, that's denoted in verse 2 by the prepositional phrase. Why we should not? What does he say in verse 2? For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Two things, uh, two similes. I like this because David obviously was into gardening. I love gardening. He must have been a landscaper. He must have loved to mow. (laughs) What does he say? Don't be envious of them. Why? Denoted by the preposition. They're kind of like grass. And when it gets tall, what what are you supposed to do? I'm trying to help you today for this afternoon. (laughs) Cut it! It, There's no bugs today. There's no humidity. You should be outside enjoying the day. It's awesome. Can the grass stop your mower? No. No. I mean, there's no way. If the grass could speak, what would it be saying? Don't do it. You've already mowed two times this week. No, it couldn't stop you. He says, don't worry about the wicked. They're like grass. And when you go to Israel, I've been at Israel different times of the year. When you go to Israel, like in uh, March, in April, uh, there's been a lot of rains uh, in, in the winter months. And now everything's green and beautiful. But if you go to Israel, like in May or June, it's dead. It's dead. You know, he's saying they're just like green grass. It comes up, and then you, you turn loose, the, you know, the cattle, and they go out and just mow the fields for you. He says that they're not going to be around forever. Grass is not supposed to be forever. And, and neither are herbs. So like, I don't, what kind of herbs do you like? You don't like any? Oregano, parsley, you know, what? Rosemary. Is, it, is that stuff eternal? Is it going to be in heaven? Who knows? You're crossing your fingers? Yeah. Um, 
he says, pick one of these things. They're, they're not eternal. So he says, if you look at life, things are here for a moment, they're, they're, and then they're gone. He said, That's, that is exactly like the, the wicked. They're here, they seem to be in total power, uh, but one day they're gone, and they're replaced by the righteousness of the Messiah's kingdom. Now, when you study the New Testament, like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 9, Paul, as, uh, as a prophet, says that at the end of time, uh, that wickedness is going to be pervasive. I mean, it's going to be like the order of the day. And then when you studied uh, Daniel's uh, prophecy, uh, namely Daniel chapter two, 7, verses 21 to 27, and you jump to the New Testament, Revelation 7, 12, and 13, which details the, 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 the martyrdom of Christians in mass during the tribulation, we're not headed to great times. The prophets say so. But it's only temporary. It's only temporary because it's going to be replaced by the judgment of God and the kingdom of the Messiah. Matthew uh, 16, verse 27 says, just for your review. Uh, Jesus says, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then what's he going to do? Reward each according to his works. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will be both bring both light to light, the hidden things of darkness, reveal the counsels of their hearts, then each one's praise will come from God. The, the, the day's coming, when the things of the earth now that are temporal end, and, and we all have to stand before God and give account. Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, and it's a long, t Paul typically had really long sentences uh, that went on and on on one breath. Um, this one's a case in point, so we're going to have to jump in in the middle of it. But he says here, uh, and to give you who are troubled, uh, troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed in the future, he says, from heaven with his mighty angels, when he comes back, he's coming back in flaming fire to do what? Take vengeance on those who do not know God and to those who do not, do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, they, they shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day, there's a day when he's going to do it, to be glorified in his saints, to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. He said, there's a day coming in the future, the long view of life, when the short view of life merges with the long view. You're either on God's side and, and enjoy the bliss of heaven, or you will experience the wrath, the eternal wrath of God. Your choice. Your choice. I don't know, are you prepared for that tension that day when uh, you have to stand before him? Because David says, you know, a wise man is, is prepared because he knows God. And by way of progressive revelation, we, we know that the way that you get prepared is you come by means of Christ, Correct. You place your faith as a sinner in the personal work of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, his death on the cross for you, his resurrection. The day that you do that, you're saved. I, I know that's true because of what the scriptures teach. Second Corinthians um, chapter 6, Paul says this. It says, we then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, quote, in an acceptable time I have heard you and in the day of salvation I have helped you, unquote, from the Old Testament. Behold, now, Paul says, is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Don't wait for it tomorrow. Why? Because you may not be here tomorrow. Now, now is the day to be saved. If you're not a Christian today, before you walk out of the sanctuary, you should make a definitive decision of what you're going to do with Jesus Christ. Why? Because David and the rest of the prophets and uh, voices from the Old and New Testaments all say, everything right now is temporal. It's going to merge with the eternal, and you're on one of two sides. Better to be on the side of God when the kingdom comes. See, I have hope that one day the king comes. And when the king comes, peace comes. I have a long view of life. It affects, it affects my short view of life. So when I, when I start getting uh, into the fret mode, I have to stop and take a breath and go, oh, okay, you know, th this has been prophesied and, and this is how I should behave in the, in the interim. But that's not all. Second thing, long and short view of life as a don't, uh, do live in a positive way as, as if your life is sold out to God. Be totally sold out to God. Now, I want to read the verses here, and, and we're going to pay attention to all the commands that are here. Notice what he says. These are positive commands. Trust in the Lord, command number one, and do good, command two. Dwell in the land, command three. Feed on his faithfulness, command four. Delight yourself also in the Lord, command three. Five, uh, he, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Command six, commit your way to the Lord. Command seven, he says again, trust in the Lord. Why? Because we have a problem with trust, don't we? 
And then he says, he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Uh, next command, last command is, or no, uh, next to the last command, rest in the Lord and then wait patiently for him. Those are all commands in Hebrew, every single one of them, which means if it's a command, it is not a what? It's not a suggestion. David's not saying, okay, number one, have a long and short view of life to where you might look at things that disturb you, but you're looking to the future, the king's coming, so I won't, I won't be that upset. I, I'll, 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 I'll stand for God and, not, and I'll be emotionally stable and strong. Then he says, positively, uh, let me give you some commands of how to behave. So I have been asked this question, I don't know how many times, especially recently uh, in the last few months as we've gone through all of the societal upheavals. What am I as a Christian supposed to do in, in the meltdown of my culture? What are you supposed to do? You just got your marching orders. He gave you every command you possibly could want to know. What am I supposed to do? Trust in the Lord, which means I have full confidence in him. That's what the Hebrew word means, to have full confidence. Have you ever parachuted? Anybody? How was the first jump? Exciting? Yeah. Did you have full confidence in the person who packed your chute? Maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. But you probably did, right? Somebody else packed your chute. You had full confidence in them. He, that's the Hebrew word. You totally trust that whoever packed that chute, when you go out the door on that static line, it's going to open, correct? He says, when you, when you think about God, have absolute confidence that whatever he has said in the Old or New Testaments is true, so you don't waffle and equivocate. So that means whatever he said about life and living is true. Whatever he, God has said that uh, it is wise uh, and what is a foolish path, like in the book of Proverbs, I believe it, I live it. Whatever he says about eschatology and judgment is true. It's going to happen. You know, whatever he says about uh, his provision for me and my life in the middle of mayhem is true. He shall be with me no matter what. And on and on goes the list. He says, put your trust totally in God, total confidence in him, like he packed your shoot. If you don't have full confidence when you leave today, well then confidence is but a prayer way for you to stop and say, Lord, forgive me for not having full confidence in you. It's evidence on how upset I am. Let me have full confidence in you. Number two, he says, uh, uh, be one who does good. See, what do evil times demand? Good works from God's people. See, the, it's easy for the godless to be showcased all over the place with all the evil that they do, but what does the world need to see but a Christian doing acts of righteousness to those who may not even deserve it. Good works. Good works. Why do we do good works? Uh, Jesus, in his first sermon, chapter 5 of Matthew, says this about good works. He says, you as a Christian are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Then he says, let me make an equation. You're the light. Let your light so shine before man that they may see your Deep understanding of, of uh, doctrinal concepts and eschatology. Did he say that? Did he say that you have to completely understand the doctrine of homartiology? Huh? Or ecclesiology? Or what? No. May they see your good works and what then happens? Well, they glorify your fathers in heaven. They glorify your father. See, it's the works that you do, which the world knows, that's abnormal. That's unbelievable. They see the good work that you do, be, be may, whatever it may be. They see that, and they automatically see God the Father because of the work. Uh, J. Harriet, a couple months ago, he runs our, uh, one of our ministries that he started called the, the, the 25th Project. And, and Jay uh, started this on his own, and then uh, he sent me this uh, picture a couple months ago, and I said, Jay, can I share that with the church? He goes, oh, Absolutely. Because that ministry, many of you have gone uh, down to the, the people that live in the, the tent city down in Woodbridge, you know, behind, I think it's a Home Depot down there. Uh, you've gone in the, in the winter when it's freezing cold to take propane. We've taken food down there at Thanksgiving. But once a month, uh, we, we go down there and, and uh, supply the needs of the people that are poor that live in those tents. And whenever I'm in my house in the winter uh, complaining how cold it is, I think of them. Because they're out there in a tent. Well, there was this one man, uh, his name is Shaq. Uh, and rightly so, because he's, he's a big man, a muscular man. Uh, he had spent seven years in jail. He got out of jail, had no money, wound up living in the woods in, in a tent there, uh, not doing well. Then his tent caught on fire. and burnt. That's, that's a bad day. Well, then Christians uh, got together and secured a, a tent for Shaq. That's a good work. 
And then he committed another crime, and he wound up in jail again. And then one of our men drove once a month for one entire year to minister to Shaq in prison. He had to drive uh, to Chatham, Virginia to get there. It wasn't like next door. And then he, he got out uh, of prison and then disappeared for several years, and no one really knew where he went. Well, then the other day, he showed up, and Jay, as you can see, uh, ran into him uh, and was so happy to see him. Like, where you been? He said, well, uh, after I got out of uh, prison, uh, I finished college. And I, he said, well, what are you doing now? He said, well, now I'm working on a master's degree in divinity to preach the gospel of Christ. That's awesome. See, the works of Christian men and women from the church, many will never know your name, minister to a young man named Shaq, and Shaq had many issues in his life, but he eventually found the Christ, and now he's going to be a preacher of the gospel of Christ. That's unbelievable. So don't tell me that your works don't have a profound impact on the culture, because this is an illustration. So do good works. Uh, in addition to that, third, he says, uh, dwell in the land, dwell in the land. This is more like for an Israelite, because for a Jew to live in the promised land was to fulfill God's mandate for them to, to be part of the land that he gave them. But to leave the land then would have been sin. So he's saying, no matter how evil the time is, do not leave your watch. Don't walk away from that which I gave you. Again, I don't know how many conversations I've had from people in all levels of our, of our government, in our military, in our, in our, that help run our country, that go to this church, who basically asked me something like this. In light of all the complexities of our culture, do you think it's time for me to retire now? I get asked this a lot. What do you think my answer is? No, don't, don't retire. Because for such a time as this, God has placed you there strategically to make maximum impact for the gospel. Why do I say that? Because David said, dwell in the land. That's tantamount to saying, stay on your post. Make an impact for Christ. Number four, feed on his faithfulness, which really just means remember what God did for you that was faithful and, and praise God for it. His faithfulness to you. Uh, can, you, can you think of an incident in the last week, last couple of weeks where God was totally faithful, you totally know it, and you, and you tell your family about it? Can you believe what the Lord did the other day? Uh, as we were trying to navigate uh, over the last couple months with Liz's uh, stepfather who has dementia and Alzheimer's after her mom died, it's been complicated, extremely complicated, almost like a part-time job, how to care for him. Um, and so we got down the other day to dealing with the Social Security Administration. And, and, and we were at a, a point where we, we needed to figure out what to do with his check and how we could get that deposited where we could use it to pay for his care, etc. And so we sent Liz's brother, you know, contact, it's out in San Diego, so contact the, contact the Social Security Administration. You're the power of attorney. Get this fixed. So we called him. Hello, Social Security Administration. We are closed for COVID. Huh? I gotta have this money now to help pay for his care. So Mark drove, you know, like 30 miles to get to Escondido, California. Uh, he shows up at the, at the Social Security parking lot, and there's one car in this massive parking lot. And so he's like, I don't believe it. They really are closed. So he decided to call him again. He called them because we were desperate. He called them. A lady answered. Hi. He's like, uh, is this Social Security? Uh, yeah. Um, we're closed. Hey, yeah, I see that. I just... The lady's like, I, I just stopped by here today, you know, to do some things. That's my car in the parking lot. Uh, what can I do for you? And my brother-in-law's like, Mark's like, well, our family needs X, Y, Z done for our, you know, our loved one, this uh, Korean war vet. And we need some help. She, oh, I could totally help you. <laughs> do you know how miraculous that is? <laughs> the labyrinth of the Social Security Administration. He just happened to show up in the parking lot when she just happened to stop by to do stuff in her office. She just happened to answer the phone. Don't tell me there's not a God. See, it's the providence of God. So he, David says, hey, don't forget the faithfulness of God. Tell that to people. So I just told you. So if you were discouraged when you walk in here, you should be walking out going, oh yeah, I'm invincible now, baby. What else does he say? What else does he say? Fifth, delight yourself also in the Lord. Uh, uh, Minerth and Meyer, two great psychiatrists who taught me uh, counseling when I was you know, in uh, grad school. Um, they wrote a book called Happiness is a Choice. You should read it because that's what David is saying here. In tough times, delight yourself in the Lord, in Jesus. It's a choice. Lord, instead of being downcast, upset, 
negative, etc. I am going to determine today that when I think of you, I am going to be totally happy because you're coming back. And to know you is the greatest thing. Sixth, commit your way to the Lord uh, is another command. What does that mean? Uh, one of my friends uh, in California went up into a, a, a an area of California where there were a lot of rocks when he was in high school and he and his buddy got behind a boulder and, and, and began to push it with their legs to see what would happen. And eventually it started moving and it broke free and then it started rolling down the hillside and they didn't know where it was going to go and what it was going to do. It was a boulder. But once it got going, there was like no stopping it. See, this is, this is the Hebrew word to commit your way to the Lord. You commit to it totally, totally. And then once it gets going, it just kind of takes on the life of its own. Are you truly committed to Jesus? Because if you are, you'll stand strong and true when times are tough. You, you need, might need to stop after the service to say, Lord, help me to commit myself to you. And then next he says, trust also in him. He's now told you that twice. Trust. Why did he say it twice? Because, well, we have trust issues. I have a friend of mine who uh, has, a, has a, a very educated person, uh, was uh, totally qualified for a job and went uh, before a board to be reviewed for the job, and this person was the logical shoe in for the job. Uh, and she was at my house uh, the other day, uh, teary eyed, because she didn't get it when she was the person for the job. And the reason being, uh, they chose somebody who was not qualified for the job because they chose it based on a political viewpoint, not on the person's performance. And she was all like, What do I do with my life now? Will you trust God? Because His providence is greater than a political board. He's greater. He's greater. Trust in him. Eighth, rest in the Lord, he says. Rest in the Lord. Wow. Too many people in our country live as if there's no margin in their life, no, no time to rest. He says, make sure that you take time to rest because dealing with evil, whether you're at the Pentagon and meetings to infinity, wherever God has you, uh, and, and darkness keeps just pecking away at you and sucking life out of you, he says, make sure you take time to rest. Don, uh, Gordon McDonald wrote a book, Restoring Your Spiritual Passion, back in the 80s. I read it uh, when I first became a pastor, and there's a story in here that is totally appropriate. He says, in the deep, deep jungles of Africa, a traveler was making a long trek uh, coolies had been engaged from a tribe to carry the loads. The first day they marched rapidly and they went far. The traveler had high hopes of a speedy journey. But on the second morning, these jungle tribesmen refused to move. Uh, for some strange reason, they just sat and they rested. On inquiry as to the reason for this strange behavior, the traveler was informed that they had gone too far and too fast the first day and they were now waiting for their souls to catch up with their bodies. Did you hear me? I read that and I thought, that is exactly like how life feels in life, doesn't it? You know, I'm, on the th I'm, I'm commuting to work. I, I got to the Pentagon and it was dark. I, I, got, I got off work. I drove back on the freeway. It was dark again. I, I haven't seen the sun for months. You see what I mean? And he says, you're, you're waiting for your souls to catch up. I think the tri tribesmen were onto something here. What, what does he say about testy times? Make sure you take time to rest with God, meaning you have time alone with him. For me personally, I do it early in the morning, 5.30, 6 in the morning. I, I have like an hour of me and God. I, I got to have that. And then lastly, he says, and it's your most favorite thing, wait patiently for him. Patience. Who here has ever prayed for it? Because if you ever say God does not answer prayers, pray that one. Because then what's going to happen? Instantly. He says, don't, don't forget, in tough times, pray for patience because you're going to need it. Uh, Charles, Coles, uh, Charles Spurgeon said in a sermon on this passage, time is nothing to God. Let it be nothing to thee. God is worth waiting for. He never is before his time. He is never too late. In a story, we wait for the end to clear up uh, the plot. He says we ought to not prejudge the great drama of life, but stay still and, until the closing scene to see what God's going to do. Patience patience. You have uh, nine things to pray for and then one command at the beginning to say, God, I want to obey those things. And then you'll be prepared to be the light to your world is what they need. Let's pray. God, thank you for the clarity of David's pen. Uh, may some point in there stick out from the spirit as to what we need to do. And may we go out and do it to your glory and to push back evil. And for anybody among us that doesn't know you, this is the day to be saved. And might they call on your name. Amen.